Hello and welcome to our webinar, Insights Discovery at the Intersection of Multiple Datasets. Uh, my name is Christina Rosu, I'm the Product Manager at Lentic, and I will be joined today by Dr. Kurt Bourne, who is Principal Data Scientist and Executive Advisor at the widely known consulting company Booz Allen Hamilton. Today's presentation will cover several topics around insights discovery, and uh, by the end of the presentation, we will have a very short demo of Lentic, and we will finish up with a five minute Q&A session. First, uh, let me introduce Dr. Kurt Bourne, who provides mentorship, thought leadership, and consulting activities in data science, machine learning, and AI. And previously, he was professor of astrophysics and comp computational science at uh, George Mason University for 12 years in the data science program. Prior to that, Kirk spent nearly 20 years supporting data systems activities for NASA space science programs. And as a global speaker, he has given hundreds of invited talks worldwide, including the conferences, keynote presentation at many data science and analytics events globally. He is an active contributor in social media, and uh, he was recently identified as the number one digital influencer worldwide. So we are very fortunate to have Kirk join us today for this presentation. And with that, Kirk, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, everything is good. Fantastic, well, welcome everyone, wherever you are. Uh, I am in the Eastern United States, just outside of Washington, DC. So it's morning here and it's somewhat <laughs> evening some places else. So today we're going to have this conversation about uh, how do we navigate and orchestrate and pull together data from many different sources in order to do the best possible insight discovery from our data collections. And it's really at the intersection of data sets that we really make the greatest discoveries. It's when you put things together that you never put together before that you get something really interesting. It's sort of like cooking, you know, putting two or more new flavors together and coming up with some new recipe, some new insight. And data is no different. It's really about cooking with your data. So let's get started with this insight discovery and we'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll move it over to the Atlantic discussion right after that. Thank you. So moving right along. Yes, sir. There we go. <laughs> So we ask ourselves sometimes, what is the really big challenge around big data? And I think unfortunately people focus on that word big and the word big data, and they think it's about big volume. And of course, there is a lot of data. It does have high volume. That's not really the big challenge though. The big challenge is what's called the variety of the data. That is the number of diverse data types, diverse data sources, diverse ways of accessing the data, and even worse, the data are often stored in separate, complete, different places in your organization. So even internally, you have data silos where the data are not even brought together, but also some of the data sets that you need to do your research and to do your exploration or to do your uh, applications in your organization. Sometimes those data are external to your organization. For example, open data sources. So if you're using, for example, social network data, if you're looking at uh, people's social network profiles in order to uh, make some recommendations for products or things like that, uh, that's an external data source. And so how do you bring together external diverse data as well as internal diverse data, who, which may be stored in completely different systems? And worse, it could be different formats. For example, a database, regular structural enterprise database, or it could be images, or it could be text documents it could be social networks it could be audio even like this phone <laughs> i'm talking in today so these diverse data sites actually prevent and inhibit data science teams from really getting the greatest value and insight discovery from their data it's sort of like the cartoon shown in the slide here of the uh, three blind men or sometimes blindfolded men this cartoon has been shown many times by different people. And the idea is that if you only feel one specific part of the elephant, you have a completely different description of what the thing might be. For example, the person that's feeling the rope, feeling the tail, says this is a rope. The person feeling the body of the elephant say, no, this is a wall. 
Now, if someone is feeling the, the ear of an elephant, they may say, oh, it's a large fan. So until you take the blinders off, until you start sharing information with each other, you don't understand the complex system that you're working with. So the same thing with our data. Until we start sharing all the different components of our data with one another, we don't really see the entire story. We don't see the big picture and understand what is this thing capable of doing. So sometimes people refer to this as like the 360 view of the customer. The 360 view are all the different ways you can see the customer, both their shopping experience, their online experience, uh, their preferences, their interests, maybe where they travel, where they like to go, where they work, what kind of job they have, what kind of education they have, what, what are their interests, what books do they read. Until you have a really good picture of the person, it's hard to really uh, recommend a really good product to that person. So we're trying to pull together all these data. So that's, that's a really big challenge. But the, the big variety challenge of data is, is even worse. It's not just the sort of the discovery challenge. It's actually the combinatorial challenge. That is a mathematical challenge, which is the number of ways you can combine all the different data sets. So what happens is that we grow data just because we're curious people. So ever since the beginning of time, humans have asked questions about their world. Like, what is this? And why is this? And how is that? And so we collect data that is evidence to answer our questions. Just like in any good science, when you have more data and more evidence, you look at it and you come up with some new questions like, well, what's this doing here and why is this behaving this way? So we get new questions which require us to go back and get more data that is more evidence to answer those questions. But with the new data, we have more questions that, and then that leads to more data which leads to more questions. Well, you see how this is going. So it's because we're very curious creatures that we end up in this world where we have big data, so much data that we've collected. And people like to say, wow, that's exponential growth of data is enormous. Well, if you look at my little sh shoot graph here, my holy shoot graph on the screen here, you see that exponential growth is near the bottom of that graph. That, that's something like two to the X power. And linear growth is like two times X. So for, just for example, if you had uh, 26 different uh, items in your database, and I think we all have many more than 26 items, if it grows linearly, it's two times 26. That's like 52. If it's two to the 26 power, that's like 60 million. Okay, that's a big number. But if you try to think of all the different ways you can combine those 26 things, one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, four at a time, five, all the way up to 26 at a time, different ways you can combine them. That's called a factorial function, 26 factorial, which is approximately 26 to the 26 power. In other words, it's like X to the X power. So 26 to the 26 power, or 26 factorial, I should say, is a number that's almost four times 10 to the 26 power. So even with something as small as 26 items in your data set, and I'm sure we all have hundreds, if not thousands, it's almost, well, it is absolutely impossible to analyze all possible combinations. So it's the combinatorial growth that's really unbelievably difficult. That's, that's the real big challenge, mathematically impossible to explore all those combinations. And why would we want to do that? Because it's really about connecting those dots. It's really, discovery is about finding those connections, those associations those relationships, those links. So one way you can solve the combinatorial problem, which is not really the topic today, but one way you can do that is through a graph analytics model or a graph database or a network uh, model. That is, if you look at the links and the connections and associations that are most important, then, the, then you pay attention to only those combinations, not the very large number of possible combinations, which is X to the X power. So it's finding those combinations that are most meaningful, that are most the strongest associations. That's how we get to knowledge. We get to dis insight discovery when we can do that, find those connections and those combinations that are most meaningful. And so that's really why we want to join multiple data sets from data silos, from external data sources, all kinds of data sources. It's those combinations that, this, that show us new connections and new links and new associations that we've never seen before. For example, like this uh, story long ago that discovered uh, that uh, when uh, men go to the store, when men go to the store to buy diapers for their babies at home, 
Uh, they also tend to buy beer at the same time. So there's an interesting association. It's when the men go to the store, not necessarily uh, the, the mothers, but when the fathers go to the store to buy the diapers for the baby, they also tend to buy beer at the same time. And this was a, a discovery in the looking at the data, both not just the purchase uh, histories of customers in the stores, but also the fact that it was the men who were doing this, not just the, all the customers. Anyway, that, that's something that was written up in the uh, textbooks years ago. And whether it's a true story or not, I don't know. But we can look, think about it as just finding these connections in our data. So we start with these data, then we combine it through different uh, techniques and data science. And that's what we call knowledge. It's knowledge is the synthesis of facts. It's putting together the facts. And so how we put them together can be very creative. It can lead to new ideas. They can lead to innovations that we can uh, turn into products. Uh, so we actually can create value for our organization uh, when we think about the, co the combinations that really mean something, okay? How do you put those combinations together to give us insight in ways that we can serve our customers better? And that's called design thinking. Thinking about what is it gonna inspire our customers, inspire the people that we're working with, the people that are stakeholders, whoever those people happen to be. So we want to be creative in, the, in, the, in those combinations. But it's not just about the you know, creative combination. It's really about insight discovery. And we'll talk about that in just a second here, what we mean by insight. The insight discovery uh, from those uh, finding those connections across the, uh, the different dimensions of our data that is taking the blindfolds off the blind men, looking at that elephant, that is looking at all the different aspects of whatever the, that uh, item is that is our system. So our complex system might not be an elephant, it might be or our set of customers, or it might be, or, or for a scientist, our data set might be the world. We're looking at climate change. Or if we're uh, in economic development, it might be the, the combination of economic and political and social factors in a country that helps us to make the best decision about what to do next. So insights ultimately then lead us to better actions. So the AI, the, what we call artificial intelligence, but I like to say it's more than artificial, it's much better than artificial, it's actionable intelligence, or it's accelerated intelligence, or it's augmented intelligence. We're actually augmenting our own intelligence from these insights that we've discovered. Okay, so it's accelerated intelligence or accelerated insights, that actionable intelligence. That's really what we're trying to achieve here. So high variety data has these big challenges. And so one might say, well, that's, that's just too much trouble. Why should we bother? Well, one of the reasons we should bother is that we need to see these different diverse perspectives on whatever it is we're working with, whether it's customers or the, the globe, global climate or whatever it is we're looking at. We need those different perspectives, just like with the blind men and the elephant, because you never truly can understand something until you see the thing from other perspectives than maybe the one that we're used to. And so there's a little cartoon which I found, and there's a link there on the screen if you want to see where I found that. Uh, uh, this basically shows this little, what's called in mathematics, a circular cylinder. And if you look at this circular cylinder from one side, let's call it the, uh, the light blue direction. If you're looking down the, the, the axis of the cylinder, it looks like a circle. It projects as a, uh, as a circle. So when you see the screen there, that blue circle, if someone is looking at a data set from this direction and only this direction, and this is the only perspective you have, you say, this is a circle. Now, the distribution of my data is a circle. And that's what you say is true. But if someone is looking at it from the other direction, from a 90 degree angle, which we say in mathematics is an orthogonal direction, so it's a in, completely independent orthogonal perspective, they're looking at it from that orange direction. And from the orange direction, it looks like a rectangle or maybe a square in this case, but it looks rectangular. Uh, as you see, the shadow uh, cylinder is a square, not a circle. And so that person would say, this distribution of data is a square. This, that's the truth. This, this thing is a square. And everybody is saying that what they see is true. And the fact is, what they are seeing is true. They're not lying. That's what it looks like to them. But because it's true doesn't mean it's the truth. The truth is that full dimensional perspective. And so in the end, high variety data is a bias buster because the, the, the dimensions and the features that we choose to explore our data is a form of cognitive bias. 
It's not saying you're intentionally biased, though that could happen, but I'm not, I'm not even talking about intentional bias. I'm talking about statistical bias, where you're not looking at the full dimensionality of the object of your study. So the, the dimensions and feature space in which you explore your data really matters. It's a form of bias, and we can break those biases by having these higher dimensions. So that's one way we can uh, see the power and value of high variety data and bringing together data that might be living in different data systems within our organization or even external data systems. So we have high variety data as a big data challenge. We have high variety data as a mathematical combinatorial challenge, but we have data, high variety data as a, a benefit that is a bias buster. But the other big benefit as we've already we've been alluding to and mentioning here is the fact that there are these extra dimensions allow you to do discovery and so for example if you look at this little toy uh, diagram here just two clouds of points uh, and the blue cloud and the green cloud if you look at it from the side that it was called the uh, the left hand side the bad projection if you were if you were to look at that data from that direction those two clouds of x's would overlap you wouldn't see that there's two clusters there. There's two segments in your population. So those segments might be uh, very distinct as they are in this case, and that, but they're in fact two different things. So if you looked at it uh, from an, another dimension, so if you had X and Y data, if you only looked along the Y dimension, you wouldn't see that there are two clouds of data. But if you look at it along the X direction, which is uh, now on the bottom part of the graph, if you looked in that direction, you would see, oh, wow, there's two clouds of data here, two personas if we're doing marketing, or two different diagnoses if we're looking at a disease, for example. So for example, you might go to the doctor and say, hey, I have a headache, doctor, my head is really hurting. And, that, and that's one single uh, dimension is like looking from the left there. That headache could be many different things. Until the doctor asks more questions or does some lab tests, you really can't separate out what that headache might be. The headache might mean that you are not sleeping well. It might mean that you, uh, you actually have some pain somewhere else in your body that's leading to stress, which is leading to a headache. Or maybe you have a brain tumor, or maybe you're pregnant, or maybe you're not sleeping at night. Well, wow, all those diagnoses are completely different and pretty seriously different. And of course, the treatments would be completely different. But if all you have is that one dimension of information, a headache, you really can't separate out what the, the real diagnosis is. And so that's true in all of our data sets. We're trying to diagnose what a customer wants or how a system is behaving, how a machine is operating, what someone's social sentiment is on social media. But until you have multiple dimensions, and insights, that is, if you have those multiple insights, uh, you don't really understand it very well until you have those extra dimensions. So feature selection and projection busts bias, but it also enables great discovery. So I like to categorize uh, insights discovery in these four different ways. And so we've already talked about uh, the first one a little bit here, class discovery. So on the upper left uh, of, the, of this chart, there's a little diagram with the uh, data clouds in, in a three-dimensional parameter space. So this is just made up data uh, just for the um, uh, entertainment of, of the exercise here. Uh, your data might be more complicated and obviously many more dimensions. But in this case, parameters one, two, and three, P1, P2, P3. In, in this space, we see uh, very prominently data clouds one, two, and three. And so uh, as we add more data, we start seeing other data clouds appear. Uh, we aren't labeled there, but we see more data clouds, more personas if you're doing marketing or, or more diagnoses if we're doing medicine or more modes of behavior if you're looking, for example, at how some uh, complex engine or manufacturing plant is operating. So I, as you add more data, not only do you see more dimensions, but what you actually also learn is about the different uh, shapes of those data clouds. What makes one different from another? What separates the data clouds? And how, how does their shape uh, change and, and as you move through the parameter space. So you see cloud two has an interesting shape that varies across the parameter space. Data cloud one is uh, pretty well separated from those two big ones there. But data cloud three is very close to data cloud two. And as we add more data, we see that we have a very strong chance of misclassifying an object if it's in that part of parameter space right in between data cloud two and three. 
So the more data you have, you see more you recognize that there's a chance for a false positive or a false negative misclassification in that uh, narrow region between those two data clouds. So there's a lot of discovery just in uh, looking at the shapes and distribution of your data. That's class discovery. A lot of kind of different things you're discovering about your data set. But what things you're also discovering is number two on this list, correlation discovery. So correlation is basically what data cloud two, you see there's a strong correlation between beta, uh, parameter one and parameter three. And correlation discovery is like, uh, uh, if Y is strongly correlated with X, for example, uh, then given X, you can find Y. Okay, so given a value X, you can find the value for Y. That's a correlation discovery, but th that's predictive. Okay, so I like to say correlation is predictive power discovery. You can find the value of one parameter given another parameter uh, once you find a correlation like this. But interestingly, in data cloud two, that correlation changes a strength at a certain value of P2. So first of all, this relation correlation between P3 and P1 is kind of shallow for those uh, positive values of P1, the, the, those lower values of P3. But as you move to higher values of P3 or more negative values of P1, what you see happening is that the correlation gets stronger. The, the, the data cloud too, which we, in, in astronomy we call that the, the banana. <laughs> okay, this is the banana diagram. So data cloud two looks like a banana. So the correlation gets stronger, and that happens at a particular place in parameter space two, P2. Now, if P2 is something that you have control over, for example, a medicine you can give a patient, or a marketing campaign you can give a customer, or an engagement you can give an employee, or a temperature that you can control in a manufacturing plant, if you, can, if you see that you can raise or lower P3, that is, if P3 is something you want to do better, for example, revenue or performance or customer satisfaction, if you can control parameter P2, you can move P3 to a higher level. So now you have insight discovery when you have this extra dimension. So we didn't have that insight if all we had to do was parameters one and two, P1 and P2. But it's the extra dimension P2 that shows us, gives us insight of how we can prescribe a better value for P3. If, we, if P2 is something we have control over. Now again, this is a toy data set. So parameter two in statistics language is called a treatment variable, a condition. It's something that's a variable that you can have to exercise control over. So you can maximize P3 by moving to more positive values of P2. But if, but if, you, but if P3 re represents something that's negative, for example, risk, or customer attrition or employee attrition or some you know some negative kind of performance you want to make p3 smaller then you if p2 is that adjustable insight that adjustable condition the adjustable treatment p2 if you move that to lower values of p2 then that will drive the p1 p3 correlation to the low end of the of the correlation so lower values of p3 so what I'm describing here is prescriptive power discovery, prescribing an outcome for P3 by adjusting P2. So insights discovery for me is really both predictive power and prescriptive power discovery. Okay, so that's correlation, number two. Number three is a little bit simpler. That's when you find the outlier, uh, the surprising thing in your data that you've never seen before. So we have some outliers in our little diagram here. And even in, in the middle of data cloud two, there's a little blue heart-shaped shape there. And that's intentionally there. That, that's a region of data cloud two where there are no data points. Data cloud two has this little void in the, in the blue region. And that's a surprising thing. If all the data in data cloud two av avoids that region, that's telling you something interesting. So when you discover a gap in your data, it might be right in the middle of the data set. So that's, that's not a traditional statistical outlier. It's actually an inlier. Sometimes the inlier is the surprising thing. Some, a place in your diagram where, in your data space where nothing ever goes. For example, it might, maybe you might discover when you look at your customer data that they never actually purchase items one, two, and three at the same time for whatever reason. You never see that that particular purchase ever happen. There's some reason why those customers avoid parameters, you know, purchasing one, two, and three at the same time, or maybe just one and three. 
For example, uh, parameter one might be a summer swimsuit, and number three might be a winter uh, parka, a very heavy coat for the winter, or a very uh, nice uh, swimsuit for the summer. Well, you don't normally buy those things at the same time because the seasons are so completely different and separated. So obviously that's a simple, trivial example, but there are other ways that you're going to have inliers in your data be the surprising thing. So in my insight discovery number three, it says outlier discovery, but I really like to call it surprise discovery, finding the unexpected behavior in your data. And finally, the last one comes really to the heart of our combinatorial explosion, the graph model to solve uh, all those combinations, and that's link discovery, association discovery. Sometimes it's called network science. Graph analytics, those are all terms that could mean the same thing. You know, but these, these types of things are used in recommender engines. You know, customers who liked this product also liked that product. So we can make recommendations to other customers based upon those associations and links. But also link discovery applies to networks. For example, social networks, you know, people who, uh, friends of friends and, and other friends in networks and, and learning about those associations in, net, in the networks. So all of the network discovery, and link discovery, is really gives us a lot of insight into our data. So moving right along, from those insights, we can do different things, and there's different levels of analytics maturity. And some people think there's these three, descriptive, that is what happened in the past, diagnostic, what's going on right now, or predictive, what's happening in the future. But there's really five levels of analytics maturity. And so the five levels include now prescriptive analytics at number four, that is not just predicting what will happen, but what can we do to optimize it? So predictive analytics is great. They'll tell you the future, but if you don't like that future, for example, the customer will take their business elsewhere. Or if you have this disease and the doctor says, well, you're just going to keep getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and you don't like that. I don't want to keep getting sick. I want to get better. Oh, well, you want a prescription. So prescriptive analytics is changing the future. It is about finding the combinations of things. So in medicine, we call that a medical prescription. You take the medication to improve the outcome, change the outcome, change what's predicted. So prescriptive analytics is a higher level of analytics based upon the insight we get from all the different combinations of data. And the highest level is cognitive, where, you, where now you have You've done the bias busting. You're looking at your data from those many different dimensions, and you say, wow, why is this thing a circle when I used to think it was a square? Or why is this correlation changing slope? Or why is there this new cluster, this new segment in my database I've never seen before? Or why is there this gap in the middle of my cluster? Why, why, why do customers never buy these two products together? But why is this outlier here? I never saw this outlier before. Or maybe it's in the network. Why are these two products are selling together? Or why are these two people uh, talking to each other in the social networks when they, uh, what's, what's going on here? So it's the, it's the asking the right question of your data. So cognitive analytics is the highest level of analytics because it's really about what we do really well as human beings. And that is we generate questions because we're very curious people. And as a data scientist, we generate new hypotheses and try, and try to infer new models from our data. So cognitive analytics is really all about the 360 view, asking the right question at the right time in the right context for the data that you have. This is really the highest form of analytics. So we have all these different ways of doing analytics and doing uh, discovery from, as we showed on the previous slide. And those four kinds of discovery on the previous slide can, can be applied at anywhere in this analytics maturity ladder. So if you're doing class discovery or correlation discovery or outlier discovery or association discovery, it doesn't matter. Any one of those can be descriptive or diagnostic or predictive or prescriptive or even cognitive. That is, all levels of analytics maturing apply to all types of discovery. So we haven't talked too much about the mathematics, and I'm not, now I'm going to move farther from the mathematics. So what, so what we're doing here is very simply what we're we're trying to bring data to action. So we talked very early on about combining the dots for knowledge discovery, for insight discovery, and then we take data from insights to action. So what we're doing is a pattern discovery, that is we're detecting patterns, pattern recognition, that is learning, so when we see it again, we know what it is, we recognize it again. So that improves decision-making because now we know that this pattern 
is uh, what this pattern means. We've seen it before and we know what happens if we make a certain decision. And so we can explore those data further uh, uh, through an agile process called data ops, where we test different hypotheses and see whether the patterns hold up, whether they really carry information and insight, or it was just a coincidence, whether the correlation has causal causality attached to it, or whether they just correlate. So we can start doing innovation and converting our pattern discovery and pattern recognition you know, into uh, products in our company. And that's uh, pattern exploitation, where we now actually deploy things uh, to create value and create action, better decisions across our entire organizations. So this is a very simple way I, I describe the entire world of data science, data analytics, and AI. It's bringing data to action. And that's really what it's all about. And that data to action comes from combining many different data sources. And so one more slide after I'm showing you this one, there's one more after this, so, and then I'll be switching over. So the a slide here is that one I put together many years ago when I was working uh, for the space agency at NASA. And that someone asked me the question about how, how do we, what value do we have for bringing all our data sources together? Because way back in those days, like 20 years ago, all these different data systems from different uh, projects lived in different data silos and different organizations. Some of them might have been at universities, some might have been in a research lab, some might have been in different countries of the world because our collaborators come from all over the place. And someone said, what can we do if we start combining the data? And they said, wow. Well, first of all, let's remember the data are just ones and zeros. So from the data, we extract information. So information might be these different things shown on the plot here. Today. What's going on locally or regionally or at particular times of day or at particular types of environments. But now let's look at the, the relationships, the connections the, uh, that comes between those two. Using the, 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 the knowledge discovery tools, KDD, we used to call that knowledge discovery from data. So that's why that KDD is it. So this slide I put together 20 years ago. So KDD we now call data science. So knowledge discovery from data uses all these machine learning techniques, both unsupervised learning and machine, supervised machine learning. Just, uh, so we combine the different data sets in many different ways to do insights discovery. And those insights discovery give us understanding and wisdom about our environment, knowing what actions to take and what things we can do to make the system. So this slide is appropriate to climate science or environmental science, but you can imagine uh, in your world uh, how you could have different data sources, you extract different uh, pieces of information from those data sources, and then you look at relationships and combinations of those pieces of information to do class discovery and association discovery, novelty discovery, surprise discovery, correlation discovery. You can start doing all of those things to get deeper understanding and insights into your system. And my last slide, the last thing we do from all this is from these insights, again, we're driving AI, we're driving accelerated intelligence, actionable intelligence, applied, assisted, adaptable, amplified, augmented, even awesome intelligence. So at the end of the day, I say that AI, there's nothing artificial about it. AI is really the actionable, assisted, all these different types of intelligence. And it comes, this comes to us through the insights that we get from gathering and integrating many different data sources, multiple data sets. Now, Len Pick is going to do that for us, and we're going to hear all about that now. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kirk, for the introduction. Uh, it was a very insightful presentation, and I'm sure the audience uh, has a lot of questions for you. So uh, please don't forget to uh, share your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, well, today's presentation, I want to provide a more practical guide on how Lentic is supporting data teams in performing their day-to-day -day tasks and how we can help them discover insights quickly without having to worry about uh, the DevOps and the infrastructure side of things. Uh, for those of you who might not know, Lentic is a spin-off from Big Step, which is a big data and bare metal cloud provider that has a lot of experience in handling large enterprise data lakes. Uh, Lentic represents the big data business of Big Step and is built around the customer feedback and the experience we have collected over the years. Um, we have built as a result a very completely decentralized self-service data lake that 
uh, provisioned in a multi-cloud environment and is designed for short-handed data teams uh, that want to put their work quickly in production. So we want to be the platform that supports data teams every step of the way. The insights discovery process that uh, was described by Kirk as well usually sh starts with defining a very clear business problem and understanding what is the data science equivalent problem to that. So you can think about classification, clustering, association rules, learning, ranking, or regression, and many more. This equivalence might not be clear from the get-go, but after the initial exploratory data analysis phase, it will be easier to identify. Note that uh, having a clear use case definition is one of the factors that can have a tremendous influence on the success of your projects. Next, the fun part begins, and we have uh, the processes of data ingestion that need to bring in all data sources that are relevant for the defined use case. We just have to gather the data that we need to, and uh, here the complexity can be quite high if we have a mix of structured and unstructured data, or if we need to aggregate data from multiple sources together, um, if we need to wait for somebody to grant us access to data, and of course we sh should uh, be able to define from the start if uh, that data should be ingested and analyzed in real time. Each of these uh, individual situations requires a very different stack of technologies and different skills inside your data team. And fortunately, in Lentic, we are supporting a wide variety of uh, ingestion tools that you can use to even start cleaning and pre-processing data before uh, storing it in a data pool. Um, Another important aspect is known as the data science first mile problem, which is related to data discoverability that can be tricky in a company due to the lack of data documentation. The documentation process becomes mandatory, especially when we are working at the intersection of data sets and different data teams. Once the data has been acquired, it is important to really understand all the features, design users that are going to enrich the data that we get and select the most relevant ones for the model that is best suited to solve our business problem. We can choose between logistic regression, random forest, convolutional neural networks, and so on. After we have an initial model developed, we need to select a training algorithm, perform hyperparameter tuning, and we must ensure we put together a training and evaluation pipeline that can easily scale and that can run whenever the model accuracy is decreasing, when the model is drifting, or new data is arriving. The model's predictions are then saved in a persistent layer or pushed into third-party BI applications that are generating reports and uh, that are actually validating that the results are viable from a business perspective. This layer can be defined as the visualization and insights discovery stage of the process. This type of analysis usually happens uh, on fresh data, but not necessarily uh, in a real-time manner. Ideally, however, all models that uh, the data team is preparing should be embedded in production application that can render predictions in real time. You can think about an uh, e-commerce recommendation engine that identifies the user's behavior on the spot and generates a high quality result that wows the end user with a particular recommendation. This is considered to be the last mile data science problem, and we think addressing it sooner than, rather than later in the project is very important. From our experience, models need to be served by a prediction serving system to these third party applications that can perform the predictions and deliver the results in milliseconds on real time data. As you can see, the entire process uh, is quite complex and involves a cross-functional data team at each step uh, of the way, and uh, it also requires a very different skill set. Okay. Even though the process uh, described earlier seems very clear, a lot of companies, from uh, our experience, are failing to implement uh, their projects su successfully. And this is mainly due to the complexity of the process, but there are also other factors uh, um, as well. Small companies usually do not have uh, the right resources allocated on the project. They might lack a developer, a data scientist, a business analyst, or even a data engineer. 
Since uh, the team itself is not complete from the beginning, they usually lack the skills and knowledge to configure the environment where to perform their initial data exploration. This can be on premises or in the cloud, could be a database or a data lake or a combination of cloud specific technologies. The possibilities are endless and making a rash decision can influence the project later in its maturity stage. Even when they are setting up the environment, maintaining it running 24-7 is not a job the data team has signed up for. With this, we are seeing a lot of environments becoming brittle, fragile, and uh, this unpredictable behavior is driving teams away. Putting models in production is another important issue since uh, rewriting machine learning code in a production-friendly programming language can be difficult even for experienced developers and we are not mentioning maintaining and adjusting the models while they are hitting the end user. All of these are blockers that contribute to the statistics. In the enterprise spectrum, we might have the skills and resources, but we usually those are distributed and there is not a very clear collaboration framework in place. Also, enterprises tend to be over-centralized, tend to have extreme governance in place, and centralized data ownership, which means that uh, access to data can be slowed down and adding new technologies into the enterprise stack can be blocked by the central IT department. As a result, local teams or less prioritized projects are going to be delayed until IT makes time to address their specific needs. Scaling models can prove painful since in large enterprises, we are also dealing with huge volumes of data so being able to empower the data team to experiment scaling without involving necessarily a developer can be benefit. As we have seen, there are flaws in many organizations and we strongly believe our approach can improve the data team's lives significantly. We achieve all of this through a unified management interface that is able to control all components to offer a unified experience regardless of uh, the underlying cloud provider. And this reduces the learning curve for a team working with a new cloud provider and maximizes the data team's productivity through our mechanisms that ensure data and code uh, is fully portable. Our data pools are mini data lakes, <laughs> are completely self-service, can be customized with the right technology stack for the use case. At the data pool level, there are not strict governance rules in force, which means data teams can bring in their data for analysis without worrying about meeting enterprise level schema demands. This approach helps data teams be agile, and as a result, ownership moves closer to the data team, both in terms of their data, but also in terms of their technology stack. Lentic itself is offered as a service, and this uh, requires low maintenance resources and as a result the cost of the entire data lake is reduced uh, significantly. Now let's understand more about how Lentic supports the inside discovery data science process from the beginning to uh, the end of it. Our data lake is comprised out of these independent mini data lakes that we call data pools that can be deployed in cloud in regions of your choice. You can think of a data pool as an isolated compute environment that is under the administration of a particular team. This means the data pool administrator can associate budgets per individual project, and within each project, so the data team um, is the owner of the application stack and the data stored within that project. Even though they are independent, data pools can communicate with the rest of the data lake and can share curated and documented data sets, as well as notebooks and executable code blocks. And uh, we will go into more details on that uh, later on. In our vision, data pools are designed to wrap around a particular use case uh, and a particular set of data and available skill sets so that the application distribution inside a particular data pool can be customized. Data pools also should be closer to where data gets generated to enable faster and more affordable data processing. And and this data pool is represented by a Kubernetes cluster. And for each underlying project, we are spawning a collection of object storage buckets uh, that allow you to ingest the data that you need to. Access to data is uniform regardless of the underlying cloud provider, thanks to the abstraction layer that we have developed in-house. This means your data is portable even when it gets shared and notebooks that are using it can still be executed. 
From an application's perspective, <coughs> we are offering a catalog of applications that are dynamically finely tuned based on the resources configured by the user. We have focused on open source software and uh, we plan to uh, develop the high standards for our applications. Scaling and access are controlled from within the management interface. Our main goal is to find that sweet spot and the right balance between flexibility at the data pool level and governance at the data lake level. Because this is one of the main reasons and problems with large enterprises and large companies that have a lot of data uh, inside their enterprises. We are confident that uh, through our interconnected data pools architecture, publish subscribe mechanism and <coughs> data discoverability feature, uh, we can change how companies are interacting with data and make Lentic a happier place for data teams. Data pools can facilitate shifting data ownership and direct responsibility on the data that is being shared at the data team level and can empower the central IT to become the governance best practices advocate inside the organization inst uh, instead of the gatekeeper. Our publish subscribe mechanism allows users to publish high quality data across data pools and uh, published data has documentation attached to it that describes the context in which the data set was produced, its lineage, its common usage patterns that can increase data explainability, increase the number of data users and their productivity. Individuals uh, can uh, subscribe for updates related to a very specific data set and get informed when the new data is available or when metadata information is changed. This ensures a clean and ready to be used data lake and the playground at the project level where you have full flexibility. Once we have the entire environment set up, which is one of the main uh, blockers for data science teams, uh, and we have all the applications that we need, Jupyter, Spark, Kafka, and so on. The collaboration mechanism in place, uh, and the collaboration mechanism in place, it's time to focus on actually performing data science work and follow all stages presented at the beginning of the presentation. Most of the analysis is going to be performed by the data scientists, data engineers, and business analysts using the tools they need and uh, at this point in time, from a management perspective, maintaining all applications up and running at all times and enabling easy scaling are the priorities of our platform. However, we challenge ourselves to give a hand to data science teams and help them put the results of their work in production without having to involve a developer unless they really need to. And this is how the reusable code blocks uh, concept appeared and how it evolved towards the workflow manager. In short, code blocks are the construction units of a workflow that represents a pipeline. Uh, this can be a data processing pipeline or a machine learning one. Reusable code blocks can either be a containerized application defined by the user or a notebook converted automatically in portable executable code. We are managing the code block creation process and in the end you have a component that you can parameterize as part of a workflow. We can have a code block that performs data cleaning, another one that handles training, another one that updates models in production, and so on. With this approach, data teams that have troubles productifying their work, either due to the lack of skills, knowledge, or friction with the IT department, will be able to get results in production and further improve on them in an agile fashion. Since the collaboration and internal knowledge repositories can make teams thrive, we also implemented the concept of publishing data to code blocks as well uh, as an easy way to collaborate between data scientists and data teams and help them kickstart the data science initiatives in a distributed company, for example. In the code store, you will have uh, a library of snippets of analysis <coughs> that you can put together very quickly for a different use case. Most projects need to have some training or processing pipelines that are required to run at specific points in time and through the workflow manager system, designing workflows and scheduling them is extremely easy and requires zero technical knowledge. 
So now let's recap how Lentic can support the data teams in their efforts to develop and put into production models. We are offering a wide range of services that can streamline the data ingestion process, data processing, feature selection, model training, model serving, delivering results to third-party application, either BI or custom applications, and also perform the model validation. And uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I think we can move on to the demo. Just uh, let me prepare the environment. Don't forget, uh, if you have any sort of problems, just uh, let me know. Um, so what you are seeing right now is the main inter interface of, uh, of the Lentic application. Uh, right now, we are in the application management uh, interface. As you can see, we have a collection of applications that were deployed for this particular project. Um, in the data pool, we have uh, some characteristics. We have a number of nodes that are part of the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, we also have some statistics regarding the resources that are distributed between the projects uh, provisioned. We have the list of projects that have been deployed. Uh, we have firewall rules that can be applied to the data pool level. And uh, we also have the ability to add the more granular firewall rules at uh, the project and application level. And we also have uh, the permissions layer that allows us to um, add new users onto the data pool. Um, the data project uh, has also some particular <laughs> similar features, but we are not going to go through those. Um, let's uh, look at the uh, data management tab for a bit. For example, this is the file browser. In the file browser, we are able to see all the applications, uh, all the files that are stored within this um, file, within this project. And we can have some metadata information about the file itself. Uh, this is metadata information added by the users that is going to give us some context about the data. Uh, we also can attach uh, multiple files to a data set. For example, we can attach a notebook in which the data set is being used for a particular type of analysis or in a file that describes the lineage of uh, the data set or how its schema has evolved over time. And uh, what we can also do is publish these uh, files as data sets. And uh, once they are published within um, the project, they are going to be available to the rest of the data pools inside my data lake through the data store. So basically, in the file browser and table browser, we have a project level view of uh, the data that we are having uh, inside the project. And the data store allows us to build that centralized data catalog that enables data discoverability for other data teams that are managing other data pools. And for example, I have the possibility to uh, search uh, based on uh, specific tags, and I will see all the data sets uh, that have been published uh, with uh, that particular information attached to it. We also have uh, the file path of uh, the source uh, data set, and of course, we can use that right away, or uh, we can um, further increase, uh, further copy that data set locally in a project in order to be able to actually modify it and uh, obtain a better performance out of it. Uh, for example, if I'm logged in as a different user uh, that has access to a different project, uh, I will not be able to see any sort of data that was shared by the rest of uh, the teams, but I can see the data store and I can actually subscribe. And when we are subscribing to the data set, we are going to stay notified with uh, all the changes that are happening to this particular file. Now, moving on uh, to the table browser. The table browser basically gets uh, populated through Spark. Basically, through Spark, you are uh, loading in a data frame a particular data set. And afterwards, you can create a persistent table within our meta store. And what we are doing uh, behind the scenes is that we are adding data information about that table. You can have descriptions on uh, and attachments for the table itself. And we also offer the possibility to add uh, metadata information for each column. This means that your data users inside the company are going to very quickly understand uh, what uh, each particular field is uh, doing uh, and how they can use that uh, table or that file for their analysis uh, inside their own uh, projects. 
and this can bring together your entire organization. Uh, regarding the Jupyter application notebook, uh, what we are doing very, very interesting is that uh, we can easily connect uh, the Jupyter notebook to an existing Spark cluster, which means that uh, your uh, data science uh, workloads are going to be scaled automatically with uh, the Spark cluster. Uh, and uh, you can do that very easily by just typing in the Spark master URL here, and uh, you are going to have a connection to uh, an already Spark master. Uh, we also have this uh, file abstraction layer that we have built internally, which is called the uh, BDL. And uh, we are using that to uh, communicate with the underlying uh, object storage. So basically, if this notebook uh, would run on AWS, we are going to use the same exact uh, semantic for interacting with AWS as uh, we would do with Google. So the notebook itself is portable all the way when communicating with data stored in object storage. Um, in Spark as well, we can load up data directly from the object storage. So basically this is a file that we are adding uh, in the object storage. And of course, uh, this is the line that actually creates uh, a table inside our meta store and that can make it available to third party applications like uh, Tableau, BI, Power BI, Looker, through a JDBC connector that we also develop. Uh, what is more interesting, I think I'm, uh, I want to show you what uh, we are working on right now. So basically, this is uh, the workflow manager. We are going to release it very, very soon, we hope at the end of this week. Uh, so basically, we have the reusable code blocks that, uh, as I said, are able to pack together uh, either a notebook or a Docker container that you are developing. So for example, this is uh, the description of a particular uh, code block. Let me create one. So uh, what we can do is we have a code block name, we have a code block description that can be very, very uh, insightful. And uh, we have the possibility to create this code block from an existing notebook that was published before, like one of these, or we can uh, select an existing Docker image. If we are selecting a notebook, uh, we have the possibility to actually preview that notebook. Uh, we have the possibility to define some environment variables that are going to be the execution parameters for this particular code block and that are going to be uh, personalized for each uh, particular workflow run uh, when the workflow is scheduled. And uh, of course, we have some uh, dependencies that uh, might be um, added uh, automatically at uh, the code block uh, creation time. Uh, if you are having installed the PIP packages or operating system packages additionally. And uh, to create basically a workflow is uh, extremely, really simple. So basically we have this uh, code designer that allows you to define uh, the sequence of steps that you want to perform and uh, each step is uh, basically a code block. And uh, for example, uh, we can see what this code block is supposed to do. This is the ingestion phase. And uh, these are the resources uh, necessary to execute this particular stage. And we know uh, how the stage is linked to the other stages uh, when we are designing it. And for example, if uh, I would use a different application, we can have those uh, parameters that we have defined within the code block that are getting um, personalized for this particular workflow with uh, some uh, values that we are passing. So um, running the workflow is going to show us uh, what is the status for each particular um, step and of course uh, the status for the entire workflow. And uh, through this mechanism is very, very easily to automate uh, either data processing pipelines or very complex end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines. So um, we invite you to test our product and uh, give us your feedback. We are very interested in the creating the best possible product for our users. Um, I think uh, the time is uh, almost running out. Uh, we can move on to the Q&A session. Uh, I think we have five more minutes available. So if so you want Kirk. to, excuse me? Yeah, this is Kirk, I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, so, so is it, I presume it's easy uh, if you're using different versions, for example, of 
different versions of Spark, for example, and of course Python 2 is now moving to Python 3, but you might have code that needs one particular type, one particular mm -hmm. version of a, of a code a package like that. Uh, so I, I presume that's sort of easy to manage those uh, specific version con uh, controls. Uh, well, actually, currently we are supporting Python 3.6.7 and uh, Spark 2.4.1, but uh, we can develop very, very easily custom uh, images and add uh, Jupyter versions uh, that are embedding uh, those packages as well. Um, it will be difficult, so for example, for a third party user to add uh, its own particular Python package. Uh, he could do that in a virtual environment, uh, but he has to make sure that uh, that particular virtual environment stays persistent uh, when the notebook uh, would get, for example, uh, rescheduled on a different node. But we can assist users with uh, that, and uh, it should not be very, very difficult. OK, great. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I think I have another question. Uh, what other applications do you plan to add support for? Actually, currently we are uh, supporting Spark, uh, Postgres, uh, Streamsets, which is a data ingestion tool, uh, Jupyter, SFTP proxy that allows you to perform data ingestion for large volumes of data, Kafka, and the JDBC connector. Uh, right now on the pipeline, we have uh, a model server uh, system that is going to pass models that were pre-trained to an external um, BI application. And uh, basically this is going to complete uh, the um, data science process that we have presented earlier to make it full circle and make sure that we are able to predict in real time uh, um, things for the users that uh, are our users' customers. Any other questions? Uh, we have another question. Any Ray support? Well, actually, Ray, for those of you who might not know, know uh, is an open source project that aims to help uh, data scientists scale their workflow without uh, changing uh, um, the semantic of their code. Basically, they can use uh, in continuous uh, pandas um, operations with this Ray, and basically Ray will help them scale their pandas uh, data frames uh, on multiple clusters and uh, multiple nodes and cores uh, within the infrastructure, and they can really, um, for example, uh, scale their workloads with Ray rather than with Spark. And uh, we are going to implement that uh, in the future, is uh, quite uh, near in our roadmap, and we are very excited to present that uh, to our users. Um, I don't know. I'm not seeing any other questions. Kirk, uh, do you have uh, any other questions? No, I think this is great. Thank you for that presentation. It was really great yeah. to see how smoothly it all, op it all operates <laughs> so smoothly. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you everyone for participating uh, into the presentation. We are going to follow up uh, on email with the video and the slides, and uh, we can respond to additional um, questions on the email. And uh, we'll see you soon at our next webinar. Thank you so much. All right. Have and a great you. day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Christina.